Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Asad Lalji. Welcome to another exciting live session of Avid Online. I hope you all have been staying in and have been tuning in to our online episodes and live sessions. For those who haven't attended an Avid Learning program before, a brief introduction. We are a public programming platform and the cultural arm of the SR Group. We conduct close to 150 programs a year in the area of art, culture and heritage, innovation, literature and design across formats like panel discussions, workshops, masterclasses and festivals. In October of 2019, we completed 10 years of programming. Avid Online, our digital further learning campaign was launched across our social media platforms as a response to the COVID-19 crisis on the 1st of April, 2020. The objective is to enable our patrons and stakeholders like yourselves to engage in the range of topics across of the breadth of the arts. The focus of the campaign is to keep me members of the creative community connected and facilitate interactions and exchange of ideas. We continue to evolve our campaign by expanding our formats, reintroducing our existing IPs uh, online and working with our longtime collaborators to present thematic programs and series. In fact, today's session is part of an exciting virtual week dedicated to sculpture and its many registers of meaning. The objective is to uncover perspectives on sculpture making and the cultural significance from the colonial to the contemporary. I hope you caught some of our fascinating videos which were showcased on contemporary sculpture. This brings me to our evening's discussion. Welcome to statue in colonial Bombay and Bengal presidencies presented by the National Gallery of Modern Art Mumbai Ministry of Culture, Government of India, and Avid Learning. Former director and retired professor of history, Center of Studies in Social Sciences, Calcutta, Tapti Guha, Takuta, and Indologist, academic, and art historian, Sandeep Paisakar, will present two academic perspectives on colonial statues in Bengal and Bombay. Both these eminent speakers will then be in conversation with historian and founder of Bombaywala Historical Works, Dr. Samin Patel, to uncover synergies between the two perspectives and urban legacies in terms of the artistic, the political, the colonial, and the social. For more about our esteemed speakers, please refer to the bios that have been pasted in the chat section. You will also receive them in your confirmation emails. Please note that each presentation will be inside half an hour, followed by a discussion with the moderator. And finally, there will be a Q&A. So please do submit your questions in the chat box. Thank you once again for joining in, tuning in. Over to you, Simeen, and look forward to a fascinating discussion. Thank you. Am I audible? Um, yes, you are. Yes. Okay, so thanks, thanks Asad and Avid Learning for hosting a panel that brings the sister cities of Bombay and Calcutta together, um, two great port cities with um, similar communities, architecture, an industrial workforce, a history of strikes um, that ought to be compared and discussed together a lot more than they currently are. So we, we ask Avid Learning for more addas on Bombay and Calcutta in the coming months. Um, today's panel is about the landscape of statues in colonial Bombay and Calcutta and the rather sheltered life that these statues have led um, in the post-colonial period um, in these cities, in new locations. Um, as you all know, uh, statues are a pressing contemporary concern with statues of slavers and imperialists across the globe being vandalized and um, destroyed. Um, but what makes the case of our cities different um, is not only that the major removal and relocation of colonial statues happened in the, 18, uh, in the 1960s, but also if we actually delve into the colonial period, we find many of these practices of shifting of statues, of vandalism of statues, 
already existing in colonial cities um, through the 1800s. So our landscapes are pretty different from what we're seeing in the West. And uh, they're much more varied and much more complex. Um, Professor Guha Thakurta and Mr. Daisakar are investigative historians. And this landscape of shifting statues um, really lends um, to this kind of investigative research. So in Professor uh, Guha's presentation, there is a very interesting anecdote about, uh, interesting observation about Calcutta's first statue. And because of which I think we at Bombay can get a few points. Um, and also in uh, Mr. Daisakar's uh, presentation, we hear about his, how he has found two statue, colonial statues in, hiding in a shed in the heart of Bombay uh, a couple of, I guess, a couple of years ago. So look out for these nuggets um, in both their presentations. Um, both the speakers will also be um, highlighting the works of Indian sculptors who were trained in Bombay and Calcutta and, and whose work involved the creation of monumental colonial um, statues that were then you know, displayed in the city. Um, I'll ask uh, Professor Gua Thakurta to begin with her presentation, followed by Mr. Daisakar's. Um, I'll ask them a question each at the end and then open the panel up for um, discussion. OK. So as uh, Simin set the tone to the point with which I too wanted to begin, which is to say that public historical statues are once again at the center of global attention as they face the wrath of the anti-racist, anti-white supremacist movements all over the Western world. And what the current wave of attacks on statues of the Black Lives Matter movement has done as Simin pointed out, is to return our attention to the long forgotten objects of our own colonial statuary in the cities, in particularly in Calcutta, which was the capital of the empire, but also in a city like Bombay. Uh, these statues, as she said, are in exile, hidden, obscured, lying largely unseen and unknown in different parts of the city and its outskirts. And this attention back on, cal on colonial statuary has raised the question again after decades of independence about how India has dealt with these sculpted figures of British imperial rule. What has been the post-colonial destinies of these statues? My talk today, as Simin said, uh, will be about the shifting castes and sites of Calcutta's colonial and post-colonial statuary, their post-colonial destinies. And I'd like to uncover the many stories of travels, transfers, and relocations that lie behind these apparently immovable figures. Now, in my larger work on statues, one of the questions that's always concerned me is about how far is the statue, the person itself. Uh, I ask this question because the politics of statuary, the cultural politics of statuary, takes for granted that the statue functions and stands in for the person itself. This innate belief drives as much the authorities and communities who commission their making and erect them in prominent places as much as those who will their removal and destruction under different ideological compulsions. But as I said, it's worth asking all over again, how far is the inanimate statue, the person it represents? So I've been interested in thinking about personhood and embodiment within this genre of statuary, uh, though I may not talk about it very much today. Uh, even in the case of the most lifelike statuary, their commemorative purpose seems to routinely exceed their representational or mimetic functions. This is a point to be thought of. Despite their largeness and privileged locations, urban public statuary remain the least visible and the most ignored objects of public spectatorship. This is another point I'd like to dwell on. 
standing atop their pedestals, set against the light at different times of the day. These statues typically inhabit the Calcutta streetscape as dark, abstracted silhouettes. Like we see here, an outsized outstretched arm marking out Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose's call of his march to Delhi, Dilli Chalo, or the trademark walking stake marking out a marching Mahatma Gandhi. The placement of these avenues meant mainly for moving traffic makes close viewing impossible and makes even photographing of the details of faces and gestures a challenge. The cultural theorist W.J.T. Mitchell talks of sculpture's deep longing for an ideal locus, for an ideal place. These statues can be seen to slip from such a desire for an ideal place to become places in themselves, functioning more effectively in most cases as landmarks of city locations rather than as figural representations. Statues, I will argue, have long been consigned to this liminal status of being not quite a work of art and not quite an icon, fully belonging to neither high or popular visual culture. So all the works of sculpture, the point I'll come to later, statues have seldom enjoyed the status of being one. And compared to the seductive visual charge of popular iconographies in the image-saturated streetscape of our cities, this corpus of civic statues stand curiously emptied of animation and affect. In fact, they spring to public attention during the brief moments of their erection or consecration, or even more through the spectacular acts of their vandalization or removal. But once restored or replaced, statues routinely return again to invisibility and oblivion. The paradoxical status of these statues are intensified by the fact that this representational genre keeps reproducing itself across official and non-official sites as the continuing chosen form of memorialization of public persons. Public disinterest has far from halted or even substantially altered the thriving career of this genre of civic statuary. So how may we trace its continuing efficacy and unending life as a repeating template of memorialization in our cities? Where this, and I want to think particularly of Calcutta, where this genre of statuary stands caught in a particular historical bind of India's colonial and post-colonial histories. The first section of my talk will be looking specifically at imperial statuary of the city and its first colonial substitutions. It's well known that this very genre of urban civic statuary arrives in India with the early British Empire and has a quintessentially colonial history of its inception, growth, and later transference from the work of British to those of Indian statue makers. The giant public statues of rulers and notables of the empire, initially made in marble, with the preference later shifting to bronze casting, were among the most monumental but also widely traveling objects of British India, with Calcutta and London functioning as two central depots of orders and supplies. Throughout the 19th and early 20th centuries, these statues, usually commissioned from India through public subscription, raised by committees set up in India, were made in stone sculpting studios and bronze casting foundries in England, and then laboriously transported to India for installation at designated sites, with several years elapsing between the time of their commissioning and their final arrival in different cities of the empire. So we are looking here at the statue of General Utram, the military hero of the Siege of Lucknow during the mutiny of 1857. It's the work of John Henry Foley, one of his best known equestrian statue. Following the commission given to Foley in 1861 by a combined London and Calcutta committee, the government of India had to send across to London 11 tons of gun metal 
for the casting of the figure. So imagine this whole material travels from Calcutta to all the way to London. And then the finished form of the statue is transported back to Calcutta 13 years later and then ceremoniously unveiled in 1874. So as cultural commodities, <coughs> statues contain within them elaborate and prolonged material histories of production, transactions, and travels linking metropolitan and colonial topographies of imperial power. So I've been interested in these stories of these material histories that are hidden behind these statues. In a city like Calcutta, these monumental objects can be seen to continually change locations and occupy new sites of display and attention, even during the period of empire. This was especially the case when Calcutta's grand monument of the Victoria Memorial was completed, the image with which I began um, in 1921, and several statues that today seem to be an integral part of the building and its grounds actually moved here from the town hall of One of the first to move was this earliest marble sculpture of Lord Cornwallis masquerading as a Roman emperor. But what's interesting here is the telltale marks of its fakeness, which are written in the very body of this impersonation, where we see how a marble bust of Lord Cornwallis is literally then transplanted onto a copy of an antique Ro Roman figure that was being routinely produced by these sculpting studios of London. So it's literally about putting a head onto a neoclassical figure, a Roman figure. Now in tandem with the statue of Cornwallis, what also moved from the town hall to this time the Western quadrangle of the Victoria Memorial, is a very different kind of statue. This is Richard Westmacott, well-known Royal Academy sculptor. It shows Warren Hastings, the great Orientalist governor general, posing in again a Roman costume, a toga, flanked by a classicist figure of his Brahmin Pandit, which we see here, a truly classicist figure, and his Muslim scribe. So these are the figures that move from the town hall of Calcutta to become part of the sculptural iconography of this grand monument of the Victoria Memorial. There were also statues like those of William Bentinck. We see on the left, its location outside town hall, a very blurred photograph. And then it moves to the lush foliated grounds of the Victoria Memorial. What's quite unique, uh, what's quite distinctive about the statue is the relief panel we see at the bottom of the abolition of Sati. So he's marked out here as this great social reformist governor general who allows Ram Mohan Roy's campaign and enables the abolition of this this old this act of the burning of widows on the fires of their husband. Now, General Utram's equestrian statue was possibly one of the last of the colonial statues to move from a street location in Calcutta into the Victoria Memorial grounds. And this happened well after independence. So we see a photograph here of the labors of removing these statues. So in 1958 is when Utram had to forego his prime habitus in the center of the city, the Park Street Chorangi Junction, and make place for the first officially commissioned statue of Mahatma Gandhi that was commissioned by Jawaharlal Nehru himself from the well-known Bengali academic sculptor Devi Prashad Rai Choudhury, trained under Avanindranath Tagore, later in Madras. He was then serving as the vice principal of the Madras School of Art. And it's Devi Prashad statue, which is installed in the place of uh, Utram, though later, as I sh show in the slide here, it the Park Street Junction to Red Road, where it now stands. But unlike Utram, the large body of bronze imperial men would be left to stand where they are in post-independence Calcutta. It is pertinent to reflect on why Calcutta's imperial statuary all remained in place for two decades after the end of empire. 
not just closeted within the grounds of the Victoria Memorial, but throughout the main thoroughfares of the city around Red Road, Esplanade, and Delosey Square. In a city grappling with the aftermath of the famine of 1943, the communal violence called the Great Calcutta Killings of 1946, the partition, and the huge influx of refugees from East Bengal, it is very clear that there were far more pressing problems that then faced the government of urban rehabilitation and renewal. This is the West Bengal government of Chief Chandra Rai, and the Calcutta Corporation had so much to worry about at that point than to attend to statue removal. It was eventually at the end of the 1960s, in the politically turbulent milieu of the Naxalite agitations in Calcutta, that the city witnessed its main spate of removals, replacements, and relocations of its imperial statuary and their exile to its outskirts. Ironically, it was to protect these statues against the iconoclasm of the Naxalite cadres that their removal became imperative. Sorry. Okay. Now, what is even more ironical was that the Naxalites had as their main targets not the bronze cast figures of these white imperialists, but those they saw as their Indian bourgeois compatriots, uh, compradors, the icons of the Bengal Renaissance. So it was Ram Mohan Roy and it's Ishwar Chandra Vidyasagar who's a target of attack. So sadly, the sculpted heads that rolled in the hands of the Naxalites during 1969-70 were those of the educationist and social reformer Ishwar Chandra Vidyasagar, we see here his decapitated statue with the cadres, and the scientist and entrepreneur Prafulla Chandra Roy. All of this occurred in College Square on College Street, the hotbed of political violence of those years. In contrast, the imperial statues were to find a same refuge, safe refuge in these years. In a short sweep between 1967 and 1969, during the regime of the first United Front government of West Bengal, the statues of these colonial rulers were programmatically and carefully removed off the streets by the Public Works Department. We see one of the scenes here of the statue of Lord Napier. We see the care with which it's being cantonment town of Barakpur, leaving untouched the large group that stood inside the Victoria Memorial. Now, the then governor of Bengal, Dharmavira, took this initiative of having them housed within these premises, never destroyed or vandalized, as were many of the statues in Bombay in the 1950s and 60s and the violence attending the state formation of Maharashtra, the Calcutta statues lay strewn in the Flagstaff house till the time they were carefully rehoused, some around the neoclassical war cenotaph. This is the statue of George V. And others were set up on new brick pedestals on the lawns of the Flagstaff house. And they were neatly curated with the equestrian statues standing on the left-hand side of the Flagstaff House and the standing statues, like the one we see here of Viceroy Curzon, which was removed from the rotunda in front of the Victoria Memorial to Parapur. Over the 1970s, under the second United Front government and later under the left front government, they began what I'm calling a strange musical chair games of statue substitution with Bengal revolutionaries and nationalist leaders taking their stands on the pedestals emptied of their colonial masters. So the pedestals remained in place, the statues were removed. So for instance, in 1970, we have the figure of Deshpandhu Chittaranjan Das, sculpted by one of the most prominent Indian statue makers of the time, Ramesh Chandrapal, who comes up in the island where an equestrian Lord Canning had stood for 90 years before he was banished to the river banks of the cantonment town of Balakpur to keep company with the ornate tombstone of his life, Lady Canning, who's, was, who died in Barakpur and was buried there. 
Her coffin was later removed to St. John's Church, but the remains in place next to Lord Canning's statue. Then in 1972, we have the sculpture of a young martyr, revolutionary martyr, Kudiram Bose. So again, with every post-colonial city, they have a very local kind of cast of leaders who come up in the place of the colonial. So Kudiram Bose is a Bengal revolutionary who was martyred in 1911. He replaces Lord Auckland on the same plinth at the junction of the State Assembly House with the Auckland statue traveling all the way to the city in New Zealand that was named after him. So you see how far statues move. He travels all the way to New Zealand. And in 1976, we have the figure of another Bengali revolution, Shujo Shen, who's called Master Da because he was a school teacher, the hero of the famous Chittagong Armory Raid of 1930. He takes the place of Lord Northbrook against the Gothic majesty of the Calcutta High Court. So it is in these years in the 1970s that the nationalist statue mania that took off during the 1940s from its 19th century colonial precedence reaches its post-colonial peak. This is also when this quintessentially colonial genre of figurative sculpture found itself continuously contending with its domesticated career as a local commemorative. The replacement figures that kept cropping up on these empty pedestals often looked quite awkward in their substitutions and subversions of the imperial masters. So let us look, for instance, at this rather stiffly swaddled, misshapen Rishi Aurobindo, who comes to occupy the place of the statue of Lord Curzon, ironically, even the same grandly ornate and sculpted pedestal turning his back pointedly on the Victoria Memorial. Or we have another equally awkward figure of somebody who is called Bagha Jyotin in Bengal, the revolution Jyotindranath Mukhopadhyay called the tiger uh, Jyotindranath, awkwardly straddled on a horse at the crossing of Queensway and Kajurina Avenue, placed on a horse. Professor Guha, hmm? Professor Guha sorry. Five minutes. Okay. Sorry, to he faced yeah. with the many imposing equestrian figures of British kings and viceroys. Or we have this flag carrying marching figure of a woman leader of the Quit India movement from the district of Midnapore called Matungini Hajra. She fell to the police's bullet in August 1942. Matungini stands here as Calcutta's first monumental female nationalist statue, rivaling in her statue's bulk the many Queen Victorias that had come up at the turn of the 20th century. The Calcuttans have responded to these post-colonial street sentinels, often with more mockery than reverence, with a repeated refrain about the failure of our nationalist statuary to ever match up to the pomp and finesse of the colonial counterparts. So I'll come to the last point here, in this section called Statue Not Sculptures, where I'd like to think about this crucial distinction between the categories of sculpture and statuary, a distinction of quality, aesthetic, style, and function, a distinction that is often used to sift out the fine art of colonial statuary from its lesser proliferating post-colonial variants within our cities. Even as it has grown out of the same material and processes of production, Statues have had to struggle to establish themselves as a form of sculpture in their own right and to acquire a status as objects of art. Over the years, we find it's Calcutta's rich repository of statuary of the colonial period, dating from the first years of the 19th century to the middle years of the 20th, which found such an acknowledgement, attracted close artistic scrutiny and research about their making and makers, and have featured within a growing corpus of specialized studies on British sculpture. And, they, and there are about three or four British scholars who've been looking very closely at them. Now, we can say Calcutta's long cast of its marble and bronze imperial men have in the process found a place in the detailed histories of the study of British figurative sculpture. They found a place 
in the histories of sculptural commissions and productions that moved between the colony and the metropolis, charting the transition from the early preponderance of marble and neoclassical statuary to the later premium on gigantic bronze castings like we saw in the figure of, Bill of Queen Victoria or in the figure of Uttram. The stories move from the raising of public funds, the setting up of memorial committees, the commissioning of sculptors, to the elaborate processes of their production in the studios and foundries of England, screening by art committees of the finished works, which are often placed on display in the Royal Academy exhibitions before their final selection and transportation to the sites of empire. So practically each of Calcutta's colonial period statuary can in the process acquire an individuated identity as an artwork associated with the studio and the style of a well-known sculptor of the period. And these names can be then searched out from the pedestal or the body of the object. So this is true of Foley's statuary of Hardinge and General Uttram. So from the first marble statuary of Lord Cornwallis by Thomas Banks to the last imperial statuary of George V by the Scottish sculptor William Hamilton, uh, William Macmillan, I'm sorry, Calcutta's colonial statuary can be situated within a changing history of technique, stylistic conventions of the British school of figurative sculpture. And it is in the quiet exile of their post-colonial locations in the serenity of the grounds of the Flagstaff House or in the picturesque gardens of the Victoria Memorial, that these statues today make themselves available for the close and specialized study of their sculptural form. In the one site, in the Flagstaff House, they're open to viewing only by a select groups of scholars and visitors and dignitaries through prior appointment with the Calcutta Raj Bhavan to visit the governor's residence here. And in the other side, the Victoria Memorial Grounds, like we see here, they're used as backdrops for snapshots and for seating spots for courting couples who do not have any care for who they belong to, these statues. And they lie waiting to be searched out and professionally photographed by traveling British scholars. Emptied of the personhood of colonial rulers, these statues, I would argue, have made their unintended transition into becoming pure works of sculpture albeit with the prefix figural attached to it, to set it apart from the broader denomination of modern sculpture and place it within a specific genre of its own. I will contrast this. This kind of detailed scholarly attention and art historical attention that these statues have now invited with the neglect that lies that has been the fate of most of the nationalist statuary that came to replace them, which stand, and I'm quickly going to jump through these, which stand ignored and barely seen, sometimes like in the statue of Ram Mohan in the far corner of the Maidan, or as in the case of the statue of Netaji Shubhashan Rabos by a Bombay sculptor, Yavalkar, made in 1967. Uh, they are lost among the crowds and traffics in the congested heart of the city. There's been very little work done on the history of post-colonial statuary, partly because it is not seen to be even of adequate aesthetic merit. This figure of Netaji is a good example of the, the dip in the standards of post-colonial statuary. There's a single Bengali scholar who has an anthology on Calcutta's sculptures, colonial and post-colonial. Beyond that, there's really been no work. Most telling, of course, is the way the identity of the sculptors who are commissioned to make these figures stand in complete erasure. The plaques on the plinth carry, in most cases, no more than the name and biographical dates of the person represented. And in some cases, not even that, as in the statue of Vidya Sagar, all we know are the details of the dignitaries who were there when the statue was unveiled. That's all we are told of here. Not nothing here about who made them. Almost never is there a name to be read, recognized, or reckoned of the sculptor who produced these statues. This information on the maker is one that seems the least necessary and most redundant in the public and official life of these objects. 
And this absence is what most insistently shows up the failure of these objects to qualify as works of sculpture, even as they barely fulfill the commemorative duties towards the person they set out to represent. As the self-assessed purpose for which they were once put in the places they occupy, fades from public memory, as in the case of Devi Prashad's statue of Gandhi, hollowing out even their meanings as statues. The aura of presence and personality retreats. Ritually fettered at every birth anniversary, as on the 2nd of October for Gandhi, no one bothers thereafter to remove the dried garlands that remain strung around them for the rest of the year. The graciousness with which the city's civic authorities relocated its colonial statuary continuously plays itself out against the callous disregard and the oblivion of the statues of its own leaders. Now I'll not therefore I briefly mention the works of Indian statue makers. I have a section where I look at the transference of this statue making skills from British to Indian sculptors. I particularly look at the 1930s and 40s when actually the Calcutta Corporation is in the, the charge of the Congress under Chitranjan Das and the first spate of statues of Indians by Indian statue makers begin to come into place. But I'll stop here and I'll hand over to Sandeep who will actually be taking us through a more detailed history of Indian statue making. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Daisaka. Thank you so much, uh, ma'am. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Avid Learning and its whole team and uh, Ministry of Culture, Government of India, NGMA uh, for giving me this wonderful opportunity to speak after Dr. Professor Tapati Guha Thakurta. And of course, thank you, Simin. So basically my talk is a mixture of my research papers, which I had read in Indian History Congress, uh, Bandarkar Oriental Institute's Pracha Vidya Parishad and Chiang Conference in uh, Mumbai. So my uh, focus uh, will be on the major commissions, uh, that is uh, full-size statues and equestrian statues, and uh, the sculptors and not the personalities. Okay. So basically we need to understand the Indian concept of uh, memorials. So the earliest known memorials from Bombay are the Aksar Virgars or the hero stones, which were, uh, which belong to the period of Shilahara uh, Yadavas, okay, in 12th, uh, 12th, 13th century uh, AD. And uh, this concept of memorials is completely different from what we see uh, in South Bombay. Okay, so these are from Borivli. During the latter part of the 18th century, British colonial residents began to erect portrait statues in commemoration of those uh, persons who helped establish and expand the British interests in South Asia and most particularly on the Indian subcontinent. Uh, the first portrait statue in India was unveiled in Madras in the year 1800s and I believe that was of uh, Lord Cornwallis. The desire to embellish public spaces with marble or bronze statues of the famous living or dead uh, reached its zenith or uh, on the in, uh, Indian subcontinent during the Victorian and Edwardian eras. So there are three misunderstandings which normally uh, people uh, have. The first one is that only British statues were erected on public uh, spaces. Second is statues were erected by public subscriptions only by the British. And third is they are the symbols of previous colonial rule or the British Raj. Largest number of statues erected to a single individual in British uh, India were those in honor of Queen Victoria, commissioned uh, normally uh, to celebrate uh, her golden jubilee in the year 1877 and after her death in the year 1901. So this 
particular tradition of erecting statues was kind of adopted by the uh, Indians uh, in the later period to commemorate uh, their civic leaders, uh, local heroes, or philanthropists. So the original uh, Seven Islands of Bombay came into British possession as part of the uh, dowry of Catherine of Braganza in the year 1662 on her wedding to King Charles II of England. And this is the particular period, I mean, uh, from 1850s to 1920s, uh, that which saw the transformation of the city. And uh, a lot of commercial prosperity in the city was brought uh, by the transportation and trade industry, while the cotton trade was the key reason for Bombay becoming India's prim primary city. So these are the most uh, uh, important dates when you uh, consider uh, or you study the history of uh, Bombay as a whole, the colonial Bombay part. So these are the uh, some of the earliest examples of statuary art in uh, Bombay, uh, which are located in St. Thomas's Cathedral. Uh, and these are memorials to Captain Hardinge and uh, memorial uh, to Jonathan Duncan. So uh, there are many more, of course, uh, but the one on your left side uh, was done by uh, this sculptor called John Bacon the Younger. So I will be talking about him later. So we saw funerary monuments. In 1857, uh, the month was March, uh, Sir JJ School of Art was founded. And after 1865, uh, Sir Lockwood Kipling comes to Bombay as the professor for ar architectural uh, sculpture. And uh, he was the one uh, along with his students uh, he, who did the, uh, who completed the two friezes, which are uh, fixed on the entrance of the uh, Crawford market. So this was done in 1869, okay. And he was also responsible for uh, making this beautiful uh, medallion of Sir David Sassoon, uh, which is on the David Sassoon library in Kalaghoda. So many more buildings uh, were decorated by these architectural sculptors later on. So the first two images are from High Court, which are uh, on the pinnacle of the High Court, uh, Justice and Mercy, the allegorical figures. And the other one is from the Rajabai Tower. Okay. So there are 24 such images, uh, which uh, are um, installed on the clock tower uh, of Bombay University. And it, uh, it, is, it was done by uh, Mukunda Ramachandra. So we just know the name. We don't have any details about this particular person. Yeah. So I was talking about John Bacon the Younger, who uh, was also known as John Bacon Jr., was son, uh, second son of sculptor John Bacon. And he uh, received his uh, formal training uh, from uh, his father, uh, who was also a well-known sculptor uh, in England. And the one on your left-hand side is the statue of Lord Cornwallis, which was completed in the year 1812 and is the first statue to be erected in the city of Bombay. The, on your right side is the statue of uh, Lord Cornwallis again, uh, about whom Professor Guha Thakurta has uh, talked. Then he also did the second uh, oldest statue of Bombay City in the year 1814 of Lord Wellesley. And uh, this statue, uh, along with the statue of Lord Cornwallis, is currently at the uh, Bhaudaji Lad uh, Museum and were uh, vandalized by a group of people in the year 1965. Then we have three more uh, important sculptors, English sculptors. So Francis Chantry, then uh, Matthew Noble and Sir Thomas Brooke. So I will be discussing few statues. I won't be showing all the statues because my main focus uh, is on the Bombay School of Art. So 
these are the statues which were made by him so this one is of uh, sir john malcolm a similar statue is found in westminster abbey again these two uh, statues also appear on the 10 rupees note of bank of bombay so that's very interesting so again this statue of chantre is of sir charles forbes is found in the asiatic society of bombay so the statues which were inside the buildings like the uh, statue of lord sydenham in the institute of science or these statues in the asiatic society library building uh, were saved the second uh, sculptor is matthew noble who was another famous uh, british sculptor and was son of a stone mason and he also regularly exhibited at his works uh, at the royal academy so this is the uh, monument dedicated to uh, reverend thomas carr which was completed in the year 1862 and then in 1869 matthew noble uh, completed three uh, statues for bombay and that uh, those were of uh, queen victoria uh jagannath shankar shet and uh, the prince consort albert so the statue of queen victoria uh was unveiled in the year 1872 uh, was vandalized uh, in october 1876 by safekar brothers and uh, then the tar was later removed by professor tk gajjar and it was in uh, unveiled again for the second time in 1898 in 1901 uh, the newly created uh, uh, a newly created law was passed uh, a municipal act was passed basically and now the statues were the responsibility of the bombay municipal corporation so consequences of this act was that the statue uh, the hair of this uh, statue was shampooed to clear bird droppings uh, by the pwd employees it was again further mutilated in the year 1950s and further damaged in 1965 and now it is kept in the bahudaji lada museum uh then comes sir thomas broke who sculpted the uh, statue of uh, sir richard temple now uh, sir thomas broke is the one who completed the victoria memorial in front of the buckingham palace he is also one of the important uh, sculptors english sculptors uh, in the colonial period or from the uh, uh um late uh, 19th century and early 20th century so uh sir uh, richard temple the statue was completed in the year 1884 and uh, he was an extraordinary looking man with the big with big nose uh, and offspring uh, or inspiring mustache and extremely long neck so uh, on the day he uh, remarked to broke at the at the studio i quote him uh, i am told that people refer me and my wife as beauty and the beast i can't understand why they should for i consider my wife a very beautiful woman it had not occurred to him that she was in fact beauty anyways uh, moving to the next uh, statue now these are some of the important statues uh, done by sir thomas broke in the city of bombay this one of lord uh, sydenham is in the institute of science there was another sculptor uh, called uh, thomas woolner uh, he was part of the pre raphaelite brotherhood and uh, he was the only sculptor uh, of uh, from this brotherhood and a member of royal academy too so this particular statue of uh, david sassoon was completed by him in the year 1868 and a similar looking bust is found in the bahudaji lada museum he also uh, did a statue of sir kavasji jahangir uh, which is in, uh, located in front of the convocation hall of university of mumbai and a similar uh, panel or piece of sculpture is found in the uh, old college of edinburgh now this is the statue of sir jamshed jijiji bhoy which uh, 
was installed on the uh, original location of Lord Ray's uh, statue, who was the governor of Bombay. This particular statue was originally uh, located in Kemp's Corner. Uh, and three such statues were commissioned for Bombay. This one is in bronze. Uh, the other two are in marble. The, the first marble statue is kept in the Asiatic Society. The other one is kept in the Sir JJ Hospital. So if you see carefully, uh, this uh, there is a med uh, there used to be a medal which is missing in this particular statue. This particular statue was made by uh, Baron Carlo Marochetti, who was uh, official royal sculptor to Queen Victoria. Then of course the Kala Ghoda. Uh, this particular statue was made by Sir Joseph Edgar Bowen, and uh, it was commissioned by uh, Sir Albert Sassoon in the year 1876, and it was completed in the year 1877. Then exhibited in 78, 1878, and uh, then uh, unveiled in the year 1879 by uh, Sir Richard Temple, the governor of Bombay. So this is one of the pictures. This is this picture on your right hand side is of Prince of Wales Edward the eighth uh, son of George the fifth who abdicated for uh, a divorced lady uh, the throne for the divorced lady and uh, this was commissioned by uh, Aga Khan and I believe in the uh, second or third decade of the 20th century it was removed from its place and today the Ambedkar statue uh, can be seen there so these are some of the important statues which are now at the Pauda Chilad Museum. So I will quickly move to the Bombay School. Uh, again, this statue of Sir Alfred, uh, uh, sorry, Sir Lord Ray was uh, made by Alfred Gilbert, who was another uh, prominent, well-known uh, figure from uh, statuary art of uh, England. I'll just quickly skip this. Coming back to the Indian sculptors from the Bombay School. So uh, the first known sculptor from uh, Western India and probably India is Rao Bahadur G. K. Mahatre, uh, whose uh, statue of to the temple is quite known and which was awarded a silver medal in the uh, annual exhibition of the Bombay Art Society. So this is the figure which he made and is now part of the uh, sculpture department of Sir J.J. School of Arts. So this particular statue of uh, Justice Ranade is the first statue uh, made by Mahatre and is the first statue made by uh, an Indian in the city of Bombay. And of course, uh, first statue of social reform were in India. And uh, with reference, uh, with recommendation uh, of uh, Sister Nivedita uh, to G.K. Gokhale, Mahatre got this uh, commission and in the year 1913 he completed this particular statue. So if you see, uh, to, to, uh, if you look at uh, his right eye, there is a glitch in his right eye. So Mahatre was kind uh, of like, uh, there were no photographs available of uh, Justice Ranade at that time. So uh, Mahatre had to uh, rely on uh, some paintings or some photographs uh, uh, but the other side was not known because uh, Ranadet kind of disliked photographs. So uh, Mahatra took up this challenge and he was quite successful and those who saw Justice Ranade uh, appreciated this work. So according to the Mahatre family this particular building on Girgaon Chopati is believed to be the Mahatre building and the studio of Rao Bahadur Mahatre was located here in Girgao and later on he shifted to Ville Parle in the suburbs. Is another statue is of Justice uh, sorry uh, GK Gokhale the one in the center is in Bombay the marble one and the copy of the same statue is in Chennai. These are some of the details of the statue. If you see carefully, uh, you can see his the specks are carved in the marble and it is not uh, attached separately. The, the specks are part of the statue. So uh, Bombay is the only city in India which has 
two statues of King George V, two full size statues uh, of uh, George V, one as the Prince of Wales and the second one as a uh, King Emperor. So the one on the left hand side is in the uh, Prince of Wales Museum or CSMVS uh, Museum's premises and on the right uh, used to be uh, located in front of the Gateway of India and I believe that is the most prominent place uh, an Indian uh, sculptor could ever get in the city of Bombay. And now uh, in 1960s uh, this particular statue of King George V was shifted to a filthy shed and he is along with his son Edward VIII is kept inside this shed. So I had identified this particular statue uh, as being made by uh, Rao Bahadur Mahatre. But unfortunately nothing happened. Uh, we had planned something. I mean the news came in midday but nothing happened. I wish this could go to some museum, maybe Prince of Wales Museum, which is quite uh, located quite near uh, to this shed. He also did a statue of uh, Lady uh, Zerbai Masina, which is now in the Masina Hospital, completed in the year 1941. Then, then comes uh, uh, Talim. B.V. Talim, Balaji Vasanta Talim, who gave uh, the, uh, the city of Bombay its first bronze statue. And this is his uh, work which was displayed in the uh, Bombay Art Society exhibition and this particular work was awarded gold medal. These are the panels on the Dadabhai Navroji statues. And these are some of his uh, other well-known statues uh, done by Talim of uh, Khan Bahadur Petigra, Dr. Akashio Vegas, and uh, uh, Sir Lawrence Jenkins, who was uh, originally a judge at Calcutta. Later, he uh, worked as judge at Bombay. This is a photograph of the unveiling ceremony of the statue. You can see the sculptor standing here. This is Isaac, five minutes. Okay. Another prominent sculptor from Bombay is Karmarkar. Okay. This is a statue of Sir Dinsha Mullah. And this statue of a fisher girl when he had won this gold medal in the Bombay Art Society exhibition. Another sculptor which he completed in the year 1941 is of uh, Vithal by Patel and this is uh, on your right is the sketch model uh, from the collection of the artist. This is the studio of the uh, Karmarkar which was converted into a museum and is located near Ali Bagh. Another uh, self-taught artist actually uh, uh, he is Farke, R.K. Farke, who was later on uh, patronized by the Maharaja of Dhar. Uh, Dhar was a Maratha state. So this is his famous statue of Pravachan. And uh, the statue on the extreme right is the memorial dedicated to Lokmanya Tilak, whose president was Sarojini Naidu. And before making this particular statue, uh, Farke had got a uh, sitting from Lokmanya Tilak where he made a statue of Tilak, a bust of Tilak with Pagadi and without Pagadi. So two separate sittings were uh, given by Tilak to him. So I found this bust last year after 100 years. This one was erect, uh, installed in Sangli. So these are some of the uh, well-known sculptors. Uh, the first one is S.G. Mahatre, son of uh, Ganpat Rao Mahatre. Uh, N.K. Goregaukar, younger brother of B.K. Goregaukar, who was also uh, a sculptor and they worked together in Gaudevi in their studio called Goregaukar Brothers Studio. The other one is V.V. Vag, Vinayak Rao Vag, who was appointed as the official sculptor by the uh, by Lord Hardinge. So this one is uh, by B.K. Goregaukar. The one on your left is the newspaper boy. You can see it also today in the uh, JJ School of Arts and the one on your right hand side was done again by BK uh, Goregaukar which is now kept in the police museum in the uh, 
uh, in the police headquarters in front of uh, Crawford Market. This is the Goregaukar Art Studio. Again, another well-known sculptor, N.G. Pansare, whose panels on the India, uh, New India Ashwans Company building are quite well-known. And he's the same person who did the equestrian statue of Shivaji Maharaj in 1960s. And also the uh, Maharashtra Film Trophy and the Film Fair Trophies. So again, another sculptor, uh, R.P. Kamath, who was also a student uh, from the Royal Academy, did the statue of Sir Dinsha Vacha and uh, this Lakshmi statue, which is there on the top of the building in Bombay City. So if you see uh, at least, uh, yeah, this is the table. Yeah, at least 37 statues were made by the European uh, sculptors. And in the later period, the Indian sculptors took over and uh, kind of broke the monopoly of the uh, Western sculptors. So we find this is the highest number, actually 13 in the later period. So I will just quickly uh, conclude. So looking at the list of the statues done by the Western sculptors and the Indian sculptors from Bombay school, it appears that the Western sculptors were actively patronized in Bombay through public subscriptions in the 19th century CE. Therefore, the statues executed by them are highest, that is total 37. A group of Indian sculptors uh, educated in Bombay school was uh, uh, was result of its academic education, which in the first half of the 20th century captured the statuary business as seen in the table two. Uh, we saw the total number 13. The sculptors got an opportunity to keep opportunity to keep their work in front of the art lovers and general public uh, through the uh, Bombay Art Society's exhibitions held within the city. Sculptors who won medals have attracted the uh, attention and gained trust of uh, the local patrons and the British government. Uh, Sister Nivedita and G.K. Gokhale's support to Rao Bahadur Mahatri for his first full-size statue in the city also indicates the rise of Swadeshi movement in art. Due to nationalist fervor in India, the Indian patrons did not ignore the Bombay school sculptors. Hence, the total number of statues executed by these sculptors is 13. Though this number may appear less is higher than the statues executed by the Western artists in this period. Unlike photography studios, there was no sculpture studio owned by any European sculptor in Bombay. The establishment of at least six studios by the Bombay school sculptors in the city itself created a new market for this art. Bombay being a commercial city helped survive this tradition which later became a common practice in India, especially in the state of Maharashtra. The statues created by these artists had Indian likeness and involved less money, zero shipping cost and saved time. This shift of patronage from the Western to Indian sculptors with their studios in the city easily broke the monopoly of the Western sculptors in the statuary art business in India. Thank you so much. Many thanks, uh, Mr. Daisakar. My um, speaking of, um, I was reminded of architect uh, G.B. Matre, um, who is leading Am I audible? Yes, yes, you are. Um, am I audible? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, okay, yes. Yeah, so I'm, I'm thinking of G.B. Matre, um, who is sort of leading proponent of the Art Deco style in Bombay, and whose um, buildings range from Empress Court at um, Oval Medan to the Car Fuel Service Station at uh, Ballard Estate to yes. um, the Marble Arch Building at Pedder Road. Um, so the Matris obviously really left their mark on the city um, and the Gore Gankar's presence is felt, you know, every time you drive past Kennedy Bridge or you walk past it and you see this imposing Art Nouveau building um, right opposite um, Queen Mary School, which you, you, which you featured in your presentation. Yeah. So um, can you tell us about this community of Maharashtrians who seem to have, a, you know, an affinity for art? Yes, um, sure. So, uh, you must have seen in my presentations that uh, there are only Maharashtrian sculptors who uh, kind of had this monopoly in the statuary business. Uh, the reason to select these sculptors is that the, they, of course, they are prominent sculptors from Bombay school. 
and secondly uh, these people were uh, kind of regular uh, artists who exhibited their works in the uh, bombay art society exhibitions so uh, the sculptors or the artists who had received a gold medal or silver medal are part of my uh, presentation now coming back to the community uh, as part of my research on the cultural history of the patharic kshatriyas or who are also known as pach kalshis are the sister community is the sister community of the patari prabhus okay and this particular community in the uh, 12th century had migrated with this uh, well known king called raja bimbadeva as mentioned in the mahikavati chibakar so uh, rao bahadur mahatre and g b mahatre gajanan babu rao mahatre are two separate people and uh, uh, mahatre sculptor is quite senior to the architect uh, uh matre both of them belong to the same uh community uh but uh, this community uh had sculptors like matre matre's son shamrao then pansare and both the goregaukar brothers so it was kind of the kind of a trend which you see in this particular community so you have many architects like shankar rao parelkar then dadarkar then gb matre as you said and uh, many more so of course bd mahatre so these also these people were also the presidents of the uh, indian institutes of architect and uh, architects so this is kind of very important people should study this aspect also uh, there are many contractors from this particular community so this was kind of their monopoly i believe from the city of bombay right thank you um i have we um, lost professor guha takurta um I think we lost it. What we could do, um, uh, I think, we'll you know skip this bit. And there are a couple of questions. Um, which uh, technical question? Which medal of Sir J J was removed? Any idea, please, from Vivek Mathai? Um, more statues are from South Bombay. What about other suburbs and well-known statues? Please advise. uh i don't know which medal was removed but uh, you can see the medal uh, i'm not an expert on medal but uh, the medal uh, is quite visible on the uh, the statue at the jj hospital and the other at the asiatic society but, but this one which is uh, located in the public area it is quite possible someone must have removed it so uh, i think the uh, municipal corporation should look into this and what was the other question about um suburbs and um most statues are from south bombay what about the suburbs suburbs we don't have any uh, full size statues uh, which were made by these uh, uh, great people i mean uh, bombay school artists or english sculptors but we ha do have busts in some uh, locations in few areas yes and we have some milestones as well going up <laughs> so we can make do with those but professor it's good to have you back yes um, yeah, i'm sorry my yes. suddenly my connection went and i'm glad i can be back again yes no uh, okay my my question to you was about uh, gender and um is there a particular masculinity that you find portrayed in the in this landscape of of you know male statues and can there be can we say something about aging and age as well um because you know there's this sort of well known theory that the colonized indians mainly saw the british age because the bulk of them would go to britain and retire so i was wondering if you could bring sort of age also into this into this question um age and aging and masculinity and secondly how do you read the figure of uh, victoria how do you analyze the figure of victoria in this predominantly male landscape yeah. so well uh about age and aging i like to think of uh, rather than the persons whom the statues were representing i like to think about age and aging of the objects themselves right so in a very yeah. in a different way where yeah. these statues are meant to be meant to last right they yeah. meant to 
neutralize the person. So while the person, the flesh and blood person goes. And of course, with most of the Indian leaders, they become statues only after their death. So that's again a very interesting one that Indians have this idea that you do not become a statue in your lifetime because yes. death and embodiment, except perhaps Mayavati or somebody who makes her own statues, right? So I like to think that of a lot of the colonial period statuary were made in the lifetime of the rulers themselves, right? And many of them died young, like William Peel, many of them like Lady Canning, uh, they cannot take the Indian climate. Many of them do die young. Others, yes, they fulfill the full service, they return and then their statues are commissioned. So usually they're commissioned after their, you know, their period is over. Now, so that is one thing about age and aging. So one of the idea that I'd like to dwell with in statuary is the theme of death and you know, embodiment. So a young Khudiram gets reincarnated as statue, right? So it's like what happens. On the gender question is really interesting because statues are quintessentially male because symbols of authority, right? Now some of, but yet female figures are very important as allegorical figures, right? So what Sandeep showed, the females are there as allegories of virtue, of justice, of law, a series of them. As persons, I think Victoria makes an entry and it's interesting to ask, does Victoria have a gender? She's queen, of course. But if you look at the young and the passage to the empress, it is the sheer bulk and monumentality. And that's why I say that later when they're doing a very simple, humble rural woman who is, falls to the bullet of the police, you know, She's made to be monumental, right? And so Victoria gives a certain sense of what the monumental sculpture will be, where drapery and everything goes. But I've been interested in terms of how far women become statues. And actually, even if you look at the nationalist pantheon, it's very rare. It's very rare, certainly in a city like Calcutta. In Bombay, I found there's a Jija Mata Udyan, so Shivaji's mother, etc. So there are a few, they're largely of holy women like Sharada, Ramakrishna, Sharada, Vivekananda. So she features as, so they become like religious icons. There is a figure of Rani Rashmuni, the founder of the Dakshineshwar temple. But the pantheon to, to, to date remains primarily a male pantheon. And it's true even of the figures of the statue maker, it's primarily a male profession. I mean, the sculptors are female, but the makers, it remains a largely male profession. Right. Thank you. Uh, there's a question from uh, Farooq Jijina, um, a technical kind of question. Has there been an inventory of colonial statues in Calcutta? How many were there at the peak of empire and how many remain in public view today? You know, um, I cannot answer the question of how many immediately, but I do say that there are British scholars and I did mention uh, Mary Ann Steggers, Barbara Grossclos and Richard Barnes. They are the three main British scholars who very closely been looking at what they call figurative sculpture. They feel London was like a sculptural capital of the world, inviting Italian, German, French sculptors. And therefore, uh, Indian cities hold some of the best examples of what they see as 19th century statuary. Many of the other post-colonial countries may have got rid of them. I mean, in a city like Calcutta, they found really beautifully preserved. So I found myself discovering these statues through them because actually, as I said, Indian art students study them as fine examples of sculpture, but they really don't know who they are by or who they are. So yes, there are inventories. I think of these scholars have made a complete inventory of not just Calcutta, but I think in Madras and Bombay too. And for Calcutta statuary, this antiquarian scholar called Komal Sharkar. He has a book on Calcutta statues. So it doesn't cover bus. It covers only the main street locations one. So there is an inventory, but I think there needs to be a lot more work done on it. 
There's much more information, many more to be searched out, and very, very fascinating material histories of their production, their travel, their substitution, etc. Okay. Um, a question from Adarsh Chetri. Uh, why did Devi, uh, Devi Prasad Roy Chaudhary chose the choose the pose of Dandi March on Mahatma Gandhi's statue? This is a very interesting question and something that scholars have been now looking. That Gandhi comes to be frozen in the Dandi March, right? It becomes the most iconic representation. And I think it goes back to Nandalal Bose's Lino Cut of 1930, where he does this, I think it's one of the earliest in Gandhi's own lifetime, of this Lino Cut of him on his Dandi March. Later, when Ram Kinkor Bej makes a sculptor, again, one of the first Indian modernist sculptors to sculpt Gandhi, it's again Gandhi marching. You know, it's Gandhi marching over skulls. So for Devi Prasad in 58, it would have come as a natural choice. It seems that Gandhi on that march comes to be almost frozen in time. You know, it is that Dandi march where he picks up the, the salt. It is photograph and it becomes, I think, the most iconic posture. I mean, later you will have a seated Gandhi, but if you think it's the marching Gandhi. So from Nandalal to Ram Kinkar to Devi Prasad, it's been the iconic form. And I would therefore say, I think this, it's worth thinking that what is it about 1930, the march, the salt campaign that makes that the most iconic moment for representation Gandhi. I'd like to hear, tell many of our panelists that there's a book on Gandhi and the imaging of Gandhi by Sumati Ramaswamy that is going to be out soon. And she looks at a range of representations and why the Gandhi march becomes so iconic. I hope that answers it partly. But I think Devi Prasad was very influenced by both Ram Kinkar and Nandalal Bose's images, even though he worked in a very, very different academic realist mode. Okay, a question for both speakers from Priyanka Talreja. Um, are any these statues officially listed as heritage or any efforts in this direction? So uh, would you know the grades of these uh, statues or what is the heritage status in both cities? I don't, I mean, Sandeep, I think Bombay would be far more heritage conscious in terms of yes. preserving many of its statuary. Uh, I know the Victoria Memorial Complex would have an A-grade heritage status. Uh, the Barakpur Complex, I don't know, but it's in an enclosed complex. Uh, it's a good question, and I don't have an immediate answer for, you know, like a heritage building listing where the statues have a heritage listing. Certainly Devi Prasad yeah. statues, there's one of Surendranath Banerjee, which I didn't have the time to show, which lies forgotten. Nobody really knows about it. So I think a lot of it requires being brought back into public attention. I think one question here was about whether they cannot be statue tours. And I know that Sandeep is doing statue tours. Uh, Calcutta has been somewhat behind in heritage tours. Bombay's led the way in architectural heritage conservation and in a certain kind of heritage industry. Um, I would love to do statue tours and take people to Barakpur particularly with permission because it's wonderful to see, particularly canning on the bank of the river with the tombstone. There's a certain affective quality with which They've been recurated in that space. You know, they're in exile, but they seem to be at peace in their exile. So I'd love to do it. But at this time, Calcutta has heritage works, but not with the colonial period statuary, nor even with some of the early Indian works by, say, Devi Prasad. There's one by Pradosh Das Gupta of Netaji, uh, you know, the one of the Delhi Chalo. But nobody really knows anything, or even say a sculptor like Ramesh Chandrapal, who's an idol maker on one hand and a statue maker, you know, and in the 70s, he's one of the prime sculptors doing it. It's interesting that modern sculptors 
seldom want to become statue makers because their identity as sculptors has a very different standing. But very often for the idol maker, and I think here Sandeep will agree that many of those who make clay idols at Kumartuli and Krishnanagar, when they acquire academic training, often through the art school and they become statue makers, it's a upgradation of their status. You know, they become statue makers, there's different livelihood that comes with it. So Ramesh Pal comes from that kind of background of idol making, and then he graduates into art school, marble statuary, and becomes a statue maker. So he has a parallel reputation. But I think Bombay is quite exceptional in the way the JJ school students very early come into the profession, right? Calcutta, it's in the 1920s, 30s, when Calcutta Corporation is in charge of statue making. And actually, George, is, uh, George V is the last colonial statue that Devi Prasad and some of the other figures from the uh, Krishnanagar community come in. But I think the JJ school has a longer history. And Bombay sculptures, I think Sandeep says, set up studios in Calcutta because they get commissions. I think Bibi Talim has a, Karmarkar has a studio in Calcutta. So I think the JJ school tradition of academic statuary is a rich one and they come into the picture much earlier than those trained at the Calcutta School of Art. Uh, Mrs. Daisaka, yeah, yes. about any idea about heritage status? Is, uh, uh, see, uh, please, uh, I believe uh, the grading of statues is not done in Bombay, but if these statues are in particular a graded monument, then the whole premises is uh, given a grade or some kind yeah. of remark. But uh, what I see in Bombay is these statues are uh, still part of the uh, PWD department and every award, maybe A award or K award, whatever it may be. Yeah. So every award takes care of these statues. And if, for example, if there is some uh, Jayanti or birth anniversary of uh, Justice Ranade or GK Gokhale or any other Parsi uh, philanthropist or, or a leader, those statues are garlanded uh, that time. So this uh, things I have observed in Bombay. I would like to add uh, uh, two more things. Uh, the uh, This one about the equestrian statues uh, of Bombay. We only have one equestrian statue unlike Calcutta has at least seven, I believe. Uh, Tapti ma'am can correct me. And uh, just to add one more thing, the last colonial statue in Bombay is of Lord Sydney, which was completed in the year 1919. I think we lost Simeen, Sandeep. I, I, I think we lost Simeen. Can you hear me? Perhaps Please. I'm just going to, uh, Sandeep, I'm just going to jump in and ask a couple of the questions, if you don't mind. Please. Uh, so, hmm. You see, uh, uh, you know, there was a question from uh, El Elka to all the panelists. Is what about the many Parsi merchants and industrialists at Dart Bombay? Who sponsored these and who were the principal sculptors? Because that was a very interesting question. Is you know, if we look at patronage and look at who's paying for these sculptures to happen and make it happen, uh, and and you know, so any thoughts on that? So majority of the statues, Indian statues. So uh, the highest number is of uh, Parsis uh, when it comes to uh, Indian statues, uh, Indian personalities in statues. And uh, mostly uh, these statues uh, were part of public subscription in Bombay. So it doesn't mean only British sponsored for these statues. It was also a group of Indians who were also part of the uh, statue committee at that time. Mm -hmm. So uh, there were also many Indians, uh, prominent Indian uh, leaders uh, who came forward, uh, formed a committee and uh, donations were collected uh, on behalf of the committee. And then this statue was raised. So uh, in the early period uh, in the uh, 19th century, we find uh, Parsi statues were commissioned to English sculptors and in the 20th century in the first, second and third decade, we find, and of course, fourth decade too, uh, these uh, Parsis are com uh, commissioning statues to Indian sculptors. Yeah. If I How did, if, can oh, I sorry. briefly come please, in Please, please, please. I think that is quite interesting if you compare 
the landscape of Parsi statuary, which has always fascinated me about Bombay, and they're all in the main fort area around the Oval Maidan and all, that they almost compete with uh, imperial statuary in the prominence they have and the fact that British sculptors get to make them. See, the, I think in there isn't the equivalent community of entrepreneurs, financiers, a similar wealthy community who dominate you know, philanthropy and institution building in Calcutta. I mean, the Bengali Bhadralok is there, but they don't have the wealth, nor do they have the stature. Mm -hmm. So it's a very interesting story. For instance, when the first nationalist statuary of Indian leaders, Devi Prasad gets a commission for Ashutosh Mukherjee, the vice chancellor of Calcutta University. Again, it's raised by Bengali notables. And then another is Surendranath Banerjee. Again, there's a committee set up, a nationalist committee, which raises funds for this. But it's happening later. So, you know, one is, it is only in the 20s. And I think the fact that, you know, the, as Sandeep said, Calcutta Corporation really is in charge of the placing of statues and, you know, the making. And the fact that the corporation very early on comes under the Congress, and it has Chitranjan Das as its mayor, means that from the 30s, there's an opening out to Indian leaders, not the revolutionaries, not the, you know, but the moderate leader, very much like Ranade or Gokhale, you have Surendranath Banerjee, or you would have Ashutosh Mukherjee, uh, you know, a patron of education. So it's again interesting which Indians become to be commemorated through statuary and the, the idea of which is the community that is coming together to raise subscriptions. And I think there again, it's a slightly contrasting situation. Mm -hmm. Figures like David Sassoon and Parsi notables who really become very prominent in the statuescape of the city. While Bengalis, entrepreneurs or educationists will make a later entry, much later entry. Right. Simin, are you back? Uh, yes, you know, yes, just to add, add to that, I mean, in Bombay, you also have a, a, this landscape of bus um, that you find today in libraries and other places that are basically raised by public subscription, but much smaller players. So you have students, yeah. academics, this sort of community of uh, associational culture in Bombay, in which a lot of intelligentsia could be a part, a lot of aspiring professionals. So I think there is this large landscape of um, higher end monumental statuary, but there's also this smaller landscape that points to city life, civic life, um, associational life, and local people like you and me um, trying to commemorate a principal, a doctor, um, uh, you know, someone, a, a police policeman. So um, I think Bombay offers a, a little bit of that, and you know, all those statues are still standing. So um, it's nice to kind of mention local um, activity also. You know, Simin, that culture is there across cities. I think communities do on much smaller scales, and often they're plaster busts, they're not necessarily in marble or bronze. But yeah. it's also interesting that, and I was talking about this to Sandeep, that our work on statues have concentrated on the standing ones in public places. You go into any of these university buildings, Raja yeah. Tower, even Calcutta University, you go into the corporation building, it's full of marble busts. Yes, yeah. The busts of Indians and British. And later, when you come to Kolkata, the neighborhood clubs become very important. And they will all commission your Vivekananda, the Netajis, your footballing heroes. So there is a culture. And of course, in the Dalit Bastis, the, the Ambedkar bus becomes so important. So it's a way in which you own space, you own figures. So that commemorative practice, you're right, is an associational cult. And it runs across segments, across cities. In Bombay, it makes an early appearance, but I think if you look at it, it's very, very interesting to see 
the bust rather than the big statue, right? And also the roadside bust, which can be made with plaster, cement, painted, not necessarily a very expensive venture. But it's a claim to space, it's a claim to a certain form of commemoration through a community rather than an official authority. In Bombay, think, uh, you get to see mostly marble busts, and later on, you see bronze coming up. So, Mahatre also, we see uh, practicing in bronze in somewhat in third decade of uh, 20th century. So, that is also very late, but his favorite medium was marble. So, early sculptors work prominently in marble. Uh, Simin, any last comment? Because I think in the interest of time, we need to wrap up very soon. Mm -hmm. I think, we're, I think we're good. Thank you very much. It is really okay. both papers really complement each other. I think. But, so. but th thank you, uh, thank you, Professor uh, Sandeep uh, Simin, for this informative session. It was truly fascinating. I, I think. Uh, Next, next time we need to do a half day conference or something on this topic because I just feel that you know I, I've seen your presentations and you're just so so uh, you know on point to try and keep it to inside a, a half an hour which was very hard I know and uh, the amount of information you'll have and the wealth of knowledge uh, you know uh, but thank you it was such a such an interesting perspective a special thank you to our partners the NGMA. Uh, Mrs. Anita Rupavataram and Shruti, I think they were both on earlier, and the rest of the NJM team for collaborating with us. And thank you for our panelists, uh, for our participants for joining us. And hopefully you all gain some insight. We had such an overwhelming response. We had over 400 people who registered for the session. Uh, but stay tuned. We have many, many more engaging programs on Avid Online. Our next live session is The Art of the Monologue, which is on next Saturday by Yuki Elias. And followed by, we have a panel discussion on the intersection between art, science, and technology on the 23rd of July. To find out more, just follow us on our social media uh, platforms at Avid Learning or our website. Until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, and remember, learning never stops. Have a good night, and thank you, everyone. Good night.